So uh, I wish that I could have shown you a picture this morning. I tried my best, tried my darndest in between services again to get it into the computer, but it would not cooperate. So I'm just going to have to communicate. If you're a visual learner, I'm sorry. I had the picture. It's on the computer, but it's not working. Uh, so just listen, and hopefully you can get exactly what I wanted to show you. But this morning, I wanted us to take a look at something I made several years ago. Uh, and what you would have been looking at is a Bible story teaching tool called the Progress of Redemption chart. So this is all over the place in Christian history, people just using kind of like a mnemonic device, just simple pictures to remember the stories in the Bible. And uh, I took a class called Progress of Redemption at, at Bible College, and it was a class developed by this guy named Buck Hatch, uh, who many years ago, like hundreds of other Bible teachers, he just had a strong passion for teaching uh, people the unity of Scripture, that the Bible is one continuous unfolding story of God's plan and purposes. So I personally learned uh, that chart in the class, and I wish you could see it, uh, in the hopes that as a future pastor, a future teacher of Scripture, or any workers that were in the class, anyone doing whatever they were going to do, our goal was to take this chart to the world as a means of teaching people that the Bible is one unified text. So when we approach the Bible, we often think of it as 66 completely unrelated books, maybe some poems here and there, some, some letters. Uh, but the reality is that the Bible is 66 books and letters and poems all put together, but it's really two books, but it's really one book authored by God, the God that authored creation. So the entire Bible is unified by a single story, the story of God and his redeeming of creation and ultimately God's glory. So the main goal and question uh, of the class was how can we, in 2020 or whatever year it was, uh, how can we look at the Bible, which has completely different stories like Ruth and Revelation in the book, and connect the two? In reality, it's much simpler than you would think because God tells his redemptive story in a beautiful fashion start to finish that we tend to neglect sometimes in our private uh, Bible reading time where we're jumping around uh, everywhere. And nowhere in history is there a story quite like Scripture. So if you would have seen the chart, you would have seen a bunch of little pictures starting off small on one end and growing into God's glory and the earth being filled with the knowledge of his glory at the end. But it started with creation in the, the very tiny first end of it. So what I did for this project was I took poster paper. I was very late on the project. If you've been in school, you, you know what I'm talking about. So the day before the project was due, went to Walmart, and I acquired my materials. I got my poster board. I got some drumsticks that I stole from my brother who was singing up here just a moment ago. Uh, and I took the drumsticks, and I hot glued them to the poster board. I rolled it up, and I put some twine around it, and I got a 90. So it was pretty good. But um, when I turned it in, I just I thought it was awesome to me. I called it my scroll of redemption. It just felt super cool just having this uh, project. Uh, but I've got it in my office. If you're curious what I'm even talking about, if you can't visualize, what I'm saying, thank you so much. I asked him before the service to bring me water because I was very desperate. Um, anyway, so this project is a super great teaching tool with just a bunch of pictures that can remind you of the stories through Scripture. So you'll see in that chart, if you ever see it, that those stories are connecting stories. There's characters continuing the story, and God is pushing this narrative. And it starts out with creation, and it snowballs into the end, which is God glorified and the knowledge of him filling the earth, like we said a moment ago. And God desires for us to understand his redeeming work throughout history. That's why we have so much of Scripture just being history, what has happened in the past. This is why reading Scripture and studying it is so interesting to me personally. I bring up progress of redemption today because uh, in the text we're going to see that the people in Nehemiah's time are going to be looking back at stories in the Old Testament, things that have already happened. We're going to see how God has gotten Israel to this point in time, and a tool like the Progress of Redemption chart are great for seeing the history of what God is doing in the world and remembering. So with the importance of God's story in mind, I'd like to present to you all a big idea for today's text, which is Nehemiah 9, 22 through 38. It's that God's people should recount his great faithfulness in the past in order to understand worship and glorify him in the present. God's people should recount his great faithfulness in the past in order to understand, worship, and glorify him in the present. 
So just another forewarning, I forgot to print a note sheet, so if you're a, an avid note taker, you like those note sheets that we give out every week, I apologize dearly, uh, but if you've got a journal or you want to make notes in your Bible, feel free, there will be the points still up on the screen. So now before we go deep diving into the text for today, uh, Nehemiah 9, let's just recount what we saw from the text last week just to get us in the right context and frame of mind uh, for what they're even talking about. So if you'd recall, starting in Nehemiah 9, verse 5, they begin a prayer of praise to God of recounting biblical history. Essentially what happens is a massive summary of the entire Old Testament storyline up to that point, and Nehemiah highlighted in this section several key moments in the biblical narrative. So last week we saw the highlight of creation. We saw the highlight of Abraham and the Abrahamic promise or covenant. We saw the exodus, and we saw the time in the wilderness. Today we're going to be continuing this retelling. We're going to keep, keep on reading as they, uh, they talk about the history. But Nehemiah is going to highlight the conquest of Canaan. He's going to highlight the time of the judges and Ruth, some prophets, and finally the exile of Israel. So let's pick up starting in Nehemiah 9 verse 22. And just so you know, we'll be handling today's scriptures in chunks just so we can uh, flow through it. But it all flows as one thought, one story going straight through. Nehemiah 9, verse 22 says, And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites. And gave them into their hand, with their kings and the peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land, and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hone, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled, and became fat, and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient, and rebelled against you, and cast your law behind their back, and killed your prophets." who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. So I pray that you can already see a connection uh, between something like a teaching tool, like the Progress of Redemption chart, which we didn't get to see, unfortunately, uh, and how God's story is being recounted here. Just brief glimpses at what has happened already in Scripture. And essentially what we've seen throughout the chapter so far is that the Levites have summarized the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, and when we get to verse 22, it's catching the final events of the Pentateuch and the first bit of the book of Joshua. So the text jumps straight into talking about God handing the nation of Canaan over to the Israelites. Last week when we looked at Exodus, it's important to remember that the people entering the promised land were not all there to see the great miracle that happened at the Red Sea. In fact, God was working with a whole new generation of Israelites. And so sometimes when we read these stories, we can, we can pretty quickly be like, how, how come they forgot what had just happened like 10 pages before? But we need to realize that these are a whole new generation of people. Nevertheless, we see God fulfilling crucial details of his previous Abrahamic covenant. The land was needed to create a nation. So one of my favorite uh, professors that poured heavily into my life, uh, just my Christian walk, uh, when I was at CIU, his name was Dr. Kevin McWilliams. Uh, he was actually the professor that taught the Progress of Redemption class. And a beautiful image that he just planted into my head and all the students' heads uh, was this, that God works progressively in so many ways. He didn't just start off telling Abraham, okay, here's my glory, new heaven, new earth, boom. That, that's not how Genesis chapter 12 went. What actually happened, and this is the image, is that God plants a seed that will grow into a beautiful oak tree. That seed is the promise to Abraham that slowly is fulfilled throughout the Bible. And the beautiful oak tree is this finality of God's glory and worship forever. People being redeemed by God and ultimately God's glory. So we see hints of God's progressive work in the very next verse. So pay very close attention to the details that are being recited here in verse 23, because Nehemiah recalls some of the incredible imagery all the way back from Genesis 15, the promise, the seed. He says in verse 23, you multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, 
So one of my favorite things in student ministry is I get to depart my knowledge and experience to a younger generation and discipling them and discipling someone uh, who's just figuring out life, figuring out their, their walk with Jesus, helping them walk with Jesus is something that truly excites me. And when teaching uh, someone the Bible, it's pieces like this in Scripture that really help, for me at least, click it all together. So I hope you can recall in Genesis 15 that God's covenant promise to Abraham is laid out plainly a second time uh, to include numerous descendants for Abraham. At that point in Abraham's life, there was still no son, but God reassured him here in Genesis 15, 5. It says, he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, so shall your offspring be. So is it not incredible that in Nehemiah's day, in this brief moment in history, as they're residing in Jerusalem, after building this wall for two months, they can look back on God's promises and already see fulfillment. That's why they even say the thing in verse 23, it's a fulfillment of God's promise. This is nothing but a showing of God's faithfulness to Abraham and his descendants. So we here uh, in 2022, we have a beautiful privilege that's quite similar our privilege, being in the present time in history, right now, we're as far forward in time as we can get, can't go any further, but right here in 2022, today, on this Sunday, we can look back and reflect on God's story by reading Scripture. When we do the same thing that they're doing here in the text, we peer into the past, we can learn so much about God, and we can learn how we can seek to glorify Him in our own lives. So verse 24 and 25 continue to talk about the mighty work of God in which God gave Israel, Canaan, the promised land. The text says, So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land. Is this not just another part of the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled before their very eyes peering into the past in history? Has anyone uh, seen Lion King? From the 90s, not the new one. I haven't seen the new one, so I can't speak on it. But if you've seen Lion King, you know, you got the scene where Mufasa, he's kind of training Simba. He's getting him ready to be king one day before he dies, which is tragic. But he's up there on the rock where they hold Simba and they play the song. And he says, everything that the light touches will be your kingdom. Well, God did kind of a similar thing back in Genesis 12, talking to Abraham. It just reminded me of it uh, so much. Uh, when he promised to Abraham descendants and land for those descendants. So to remind us fully uh, just of the importance of the promise, I'd like to just reread it. It's Genesis 12, 1 through 3, if you want to flip there. But it says, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we can see here in 2022, we can see Jesus as the, the ultimate fulfillment that all the families of the earth shall be blessed through the blood of Abraham. But their perspective, they're seeing that God takes care of his people when they went into the promised land. He was actively fulfilling these promises and remaining faithful from the very start. So speaking of conquering the land, a large point of that chart uh, from Progress of Redemption, uh, a large point that it makes is that during the conquering, you've got two really good examples of how things went down in the conquering of Canaan. So the first example is Jericho, which is a really good example. Then you have another example, Ai, which is a not good example of how things were, were happening. So the battle of Jericho is a huge Old Testament highlight because just like the passage of Nehemiah is saying, God delivered Jericho to the people of Israel. God handed it to them. There wasn't anything special that the Israelites did, and some would argue, well, they had to blow the trumpet. But if you've ever blown a trumpet before, it's not going to knock a building down. That's the power of God at work. So uh, it was God that was doing the triumphant work in that moment in the battle of Jericho. It wasn't the trumpets. But secondly, we see a failure and a rebellion against God in the story of Ai. So if you know the story of Ai, it follows Jericho. And if you've heard the story, Israel gets kind of cocky. They only send a few men to Ai, but it goes horribly wrong. Lots of men die. It's not good. And it all results from the sin of a man named Achan. 
who kept some of the loot for himself from a previous endeavor that they, they took part in, and he kept it for himself sinfully against God, keeping God's spoils from him. So these two examples highlight how God is working in Israel. God is faithful to fulfill his promises, but just like Achan's sin messed up things at Ai, in verse 26, Nehemiah recounts the disobedience and rebellion of Israel and the result of their sins. So you may ask, what does disobedience and rebellion cause for Israel? Well, we can just continue reading into the time of the judges. Nehemiah 9, starting in verse 27 through 31, it says, therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies, who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules. Which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through the prophets. Yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of, their peop of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. So this brings us to our next point today, is that sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. Immediately, in verse 27, we see that God gives Israel into the hand of their enemies. It's not a good thing. This brings us up to the time of the judges and Ruth. These verses refer to the Lord's abundant compassion, and these saviors that we see referred to in the passage are most likely the several judges or local leaders that God provided in order to deliver, deliver Israel from their oppressors. So the way I always like to think of judges with the, the progress of redemption chart, there's a little square highlighting just a small portion of the 12 tribes. So they're just local people that God raises up in different parts of Israel in order to deliver them from whatever problems is, are going on. So this is a great point in biblical history to remember this vicious cycle of the judges that's described here in verse 28. So as the Levites are remembering the sins of Israel in the past and God's faithfulness throughout the dark times, they remembered that the people of God rebelled and disobeyed, which led to oppression, which led to them crying out to God for help, in which God raised them up a judge to deliver them, and the people would praise God, and then the cycle would continue as it says in the text. So you may recall uh, many stories in the book of Judges, and it's truly a dark book to read um, just with the state of Israel because it's pretty bleak. And it had everything to do with sin and disobedience, not actually purging Canaanites uh, from the land as God commanded. And verse 29 highlights how God would warn his people to turn back to the law. But yet again, the Levites here in the text recount that the people continued to sin. They turn a stubborn shoulder and stiffen their necks. Prophets were pointing people back to the Torah of Moses, the law of God, but Israel kept responding with sin against God. So can you see yourself in the text a little bit today? A little bit of, of your human nature in there? Because I think uh, when we read and we recount biblical history, if we're flying by it, sometimes we, we can often think, how could they mess up so badly? God just delivered them. How could they mess up just a few years later? A reality that we can take from this scripture and examine ourselves with is that we, just like Israel, fall flat on our faces all the time. We sin against a perfect and holy God because we are sinful. But there is good news within that. It's that despite our failures, and even in the text, despite the failures of Israel, God doesn't change. God doesn't change who he is, and he doesn't fail because we fail. He is always faithful to his promises. So we know that he's faithful to all of his promises, despite our failures, because of history. This is why this passage is, is pretty exciting to me, because I love uh, stuff like Progress of Redemption, where I can just look back and be like, oh, that's the whole scripture unified in one story. 
history teaches us that God has been faithful. Jesus came to earth, God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life that we can never live. Jesus ministered, he healed, and he was treated like dirt. But Jesus was crucified, and he died bearing the full wrath of God, and he was buried. After being buried, Jesus rose in three days, establishing his power over sin and death forever. The reason I mention that, the truth of the gospel, is because when we think of the judges, I think it's a good time to to just compare and contrast. Think of the judges. They were local leaders who God sent to deliver Israel temporarily. But Jesus is a Savior that is not bound by borders. He's a universal Savior. And Jesus saves eternally, not temporarily. So Jesus died in order to atone for our sins, and this is the truth of the gospel that's free to all who would repent of their sin and believe. So that's how we know that God is faithful through history. We, in 2022, we can look back on the entirety of Scripture because we're here in the present. We got all of history to look back on and see God's faithfulness. So here's something that blows my mind in the text. God's people at the end of Judges, were willing to blatantly assault fellow Israelites. If you read the end of the book of Judges, they're willing to assault fellow Israelites for the sake of temporal pleasure, but that still didn't stop Jesus. Moses claimed not to be good enough. He got angry. He hit a rock. It didn't stop God. Jesus didn't stop Achan when he stole from what was going to be an offering to the Lord. It didn't stop God from doing what God promised to do. God is faithful no matter what. So verse 30 and 31 continue to highlight the grace, the mercy, and the faithfulness of God. God is patient and is kind and has steadfast love that we cannot comprehend. If you're a word study nerd like me sometimes, do chesed. Steadfast love in the Old Testament. It's a beautiful, beautiful study. This section is incredible at highlighting the weakness of men, but the strength of the Almighty God. He's more awesome, he's more powerful, and he's more loving than we could ever understand. It is only he who is the hope of humanity, both in Nehemiah's time and our time today. God is the only hope. So despite our sin, despite the sin of the people in the text, God is faithful to fulfill his promises and his goals. And this reminiscence of the failures of Israel will lead the people to consider their own situation. So they think back to the time of the judges with this vicious sin cycle, and now they're going to reflect inwardly to their own hearts. We read Nehemiah 9, 32 through 35. It says, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you, that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people, since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked ways. So the Levites begin this final uh, section with a plea for restoration. They address their own situation and have discussed in length that in spite of the history of Israel's rebellion, God has continued in his patience and mercy to Israel. The Levites are asking God to continue being merciful in their own day. They're asking God to do it again, basically, in regard to showing his mercy to Israel. It doesn't seem like they're demanding political justice over what has happened uh, in recent years with the falling of Israel because they acknowledge that God was just in doing what he did. But the case seems that the people, uh, or the case that the people seem to be making, is for God to just show his mercies anew. So what we see immediately after that is a large section of sin confession. Verse 33 denotes the people in Nehemiah's time acting wickedly against God. And verse 34 and 35 highlights the kings, the priests, the fathers, their families who have not kept God's commandments. They list out 
all these people who have sinned against God. And in this confession, they provide a reminder that God continued to be merciful towards those people. God was good to them, even though they were unfaithful. As we seek to draw close to God, I think that we should be grieving and confessing our own sin in a much similar fashion. James Hamilton puts it like this. He says, I encourage you to make the same argument, make the same plea. When you want to bless God, when you want to praise him, this is what you do. Take stock of all his goodness to you, then make confession of your sins. Confess all your sins, own up, make a full accounting of your iniquity, then rehearse the repetitions of his mercies and ask him for more mercy. So you see, just like the Israelites in Nehemiah's time period, we are failing God. We know it, we're sinful. We're failing God and we should seek to reconcile with him. As believers, we can't just sit in our sin and flounder in it and enjoy it, but we should continually evaluate ourselves. We should be repenting of our sin and we should be chasing after Christ. Which this is the beauty of sanctification, which is just a big word that basically means that God, through the Holy Spirit, is constantly working on us. He's constantly molding us to be more and more like Christ. Because we know, for those of us that have been believers uh, for quite some time, we know that when, when we were saved, when God saved us, we weren't immediately perfect. It's just not how it works. We still sin, and we need to feel convicted, repent of that sin, and God will sanctify and mold us. When we come uh, before God, we can be honest, we can confess our sins, telling him where we failed, but we can also be encouraged by God's great mercy and his grace. So at Somersault, the camp that we were at uh, two weeks ago now, feels like forever ago, two weeks ago, uh, the camp, it was great. We had daily devotions and a little booklet that they gave all the students, um, and I thought they were super well-written, they were super engaging, and on the final day there, there was a chart um, that had the, the cross on I can't, I should have got a picture of it, I can't explain it perfectly, um, but to sum up the chart, basically, because I, I just felt so uh, convicted over my own walk with Christ when I, when I saw it. To sum it up, it was basically a reminder to not think so little of our sin that we don't make it a big deal, but not to think that our sin is bigger than Jesus' atoning work on the cross. It was a reminder to me that I need to confess my sin daily, that we as a church, as God's people, we need to confess our sins daily to the Lord. We need to be seeing the severity of our sin and truly grieve when we sin against God. But also, we need to find comfort in God and his faithfulness, that God offers salvation and freedom from the burden of sin. To the saints that have walked with Jesus for uh, some time, you know exactly what I mean when I say that you can pretend that your sin isn't that bad sometimes in life. You can pretend and say, well, I, I know I sin, but it's not that bad. I know I sin, but it's not as bad as this other sin that I committed like three months ago. We can pretend but the truth is, Jesus' sacrifice was not cheap. It was not cheap. We can also make the opposite error, so we can pretend, or we can be caught in performance, the error of performance, feeling like we need to earn our salvation. Just how he said Jesus' sacrifice was not cheap, it was actually so expensive that there is no way that we could possibly afford it in our wildest dreams. It was God's perfection and his death, burial, and resurrection that was necessary for salvation. So we can either perform or we can pretend. And just like the people in the passage, we should be crying out to God to renew his mercies and repent of our sins, confessing to a father who cares, who listens. And I'd urge you, brothers and sisters, if you have unconfessed sin in your life, I just pray that you would confess to God today. This is what I love about accountability partners, other people that you can set up to just keep you accountable, to send you a text. Have you prayed? Have you read your scriptures lately? Or even, hey, how, how are you doing with this sin area in your life that you confided in me about? This is a, a beautiful thing at CIU. Um, I was in a small group of guys on my dorm uh, that just poured greatly into me and a couple of the other uh, young guys who'd just come uh, to CIU. 
but our RA, he was huge. He was so instrumental in all of our uh, just faith walks with Jesus because he was a great accountability partner. He would be someone that we could go to while we're confessing our sin to the Father. We could have a, a human accountability partner to say, hey, this is the sin I'm struggling with. Will you just ask me how's it going? Keep me accountable. So now we're going to go into Nehemiah 9, 36 and 37. It says, Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please. We are in great distress. And we are in great distress. So now we're reading about the current predicament of the people. Israel in the past had already been enslaved to Egypt at one point in history, and the people are willing to call upon the Lord in their great distress in the moment, hoping that he would deliver them again. So when you look at the history of Israel in the Old Testament, you find that there's a point where things seem to look incredibly good for the chosen nation. God's presence God's presence fills the temple in Jerusalem, scriptures tell us. There was a great king in David and King Solomon, but it all fell apart because of sin. Solomon took on many wives that he allowed to corrupt his heart toward worshiping other gods. And all of a sudden, within one generation, you have a nation that not only has the temple to the God of Jacob, but it has all these false altars to idols that people are worshiping. So God allowed the nation to be split. Israel split into Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And eventually it was conquered by Assyria for the north and Babylon to the south. So this cry for help in the passage is very solemn. At least when I read the text, it seems that way. They need the Lord's help because it's not through their own strength that they can be delivered from their oppressors. This is another point where tools like the Progress of Redemption chart or other uh, great just Bible imagery charts uh, really bring the Bible to life for me personally. Because with a great teaching tool, you can recall scripture and stories of God's work, and we can quickly remember the history that these people are talking about when they're saying that they're enslaved. We can quickly remember that history up to this point in Nehemiah, and we can understand the heartache of the Jewish people, how it must have felt being pushed from the land that was promised by God because of their own sin. Fortunately for Nehemiah and the people in Jerusalem, God has been working mightily through them. God has been working through these people. He allowed them to return to Jerusalem to build the wall and here to recount the great and awesome works that God had done for the generations prior. So God is absolutely faithful. Like many of you, or I hope at least, I have favorite songs. If you don't have a favorite song, you should really find one because music is a blessing. But one of my favorite Christian songs of all time is called Though You Slay Me. It's a very solemn song, but it speaks to the reality that life isn't easy and we face real consequences for our sins. But despite that, God is still worthy of all praise. So the song reminds me of how it uh, could have felt maybe as an exiled Jew, as someone who looks back in history and sees what God promised, the land. He promised abundance, but we messed it up and were in exile. They lost their kings. They lost their land. They lost their temple. They lost the capital city, had been ruined. And the song, Though You Slay Me, the chorus of it reads, Though You Slay Me, Yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I worship. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. So God, though you slay me, yet I will praise you. When I read of the people in Nehemiah's day in this text, I can't help but think of that song because things to me would still seem pretty bleak. We can think that things are good right now. They just built the wall. They can be excited about that, maybe. But the truth is, even building the wall, they were being harassed and threatened from people on the outside. I can't help but think of that song. But in this passage, they're seeking to repent of their sin and turn to God, though God had slain Israel, though God had allowed oppressors to come in and conquer and take the land Though God allowed Israel to be captured and the people to be exiled, he's still worthy of worship and devotion. 
Remembering the works that God had done helps keep the focus on God and His faithfulness. So Crosspoint, how do we apply these verses today? And the big idea for today, which was that God's people should recount His great faithfulness in the past in order to understand, worship, and glorify Him in the present. So I have two points of application today. Firstly, tell someone God's story. Or at least you can invite them to church to hear it. And also share the gospel. Telling people God's story, sharing the gospel. As Nehemiah and the people in Jerusalem, they recount God's faithfulness in the Torah, the time of the judges and other scriptures. They're reminding themselves of God's story, what God has already done. God authored creation and has continued to drive the narrative toward his kingdom and his glory since the dawn of it all. But you can also tell your personal story, your testimony, how God has been faithful and worked in your life, how he saved a wretched sinner like you and me. The personal testimony is sharing the story of how God saved you through the mighty power of the gospel. So that's the first application. Tell someone God's story, share the gospel. Second application, we can see what the people did in the text and find out. So Nehemiah 9.38 says, Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So the Levites, here in the text, they offer the people immediate application. After reflecting on God's goodness, talking through the stories of the Old Testament, what God has been working through, through Israel, thinking of God's mercy and their own sin, they cut a covenant of faith. Details of this covenant are going to be found later in Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, which we'll hopefully be getting to soon. Uh, But what we can learn from this is that when we reflect on God's faithfulness, when we look at history and how God has worked through history, if you're not a believer here today, then you can decide to enter into a saving relationship with God, submitting to Him as Lord and Savior. Much like the people entered into covenant with God, you too can accept the great mercy and grace offered through the gospel of Jesus. And for the believer here today, I think that this means that as we reflect upon God in our own lives, that we should set our focus back on Him. We should remind ourselves of Him. Oftentimes in life, we get caught up in things that we think are important, that we think are more important than God And I actually recently had a brief conversation in my office this week uh, with a church member. He just came in talking about uh, just his job and how busy it gets. And I was talking about VBS and how I felt distracted and everything was going on. It was crazy. Um, But he just reminded me. He says, man, in 2022, we've got so many distractions to keep us from God. The truth is we need to fix our gaze upon the one who can save. We need to fix our gaze upon Jesus Because we get caught up in a vicious cycle, just like the time of the judges, where we're desperate for God, we find ourselves in sin, we repent, and God helps us. But then we find ourselves back there again. So any time that we recount biblical history, the things that God is doing in history, and maybe even in our own lives, we should remember to turn our eyes back to Him, to refocus on Jesus. One theologian puts it like this. He says, if you're not a Christian, when you feel the weight of God's justice hanging over you, look to Christ. Seek the Lord who acts according to his great mercy and forgives people. Trust him to do that for you. If you are a Christian, but you struggle with guilt, look to Christ. Celebrate God's great mercy and live in that mercy. No wrath remains for those who hope in Christ. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we just thank you for the text today in Nehemiah chapter 9. Lord, we thank you uh, just for the example of recounting biblical history. Lord, what you have done through history. Lord, we thank you that they were appreciating it, that they felt convicted. They repented and confessed their sin, and they sought to keep covenant with you. God, I pray the same thing for us, that we could turn our focus to you, as believers, and Lord, if anyone here does not know you, Lord, that they could just acknowledge you as the only way, the truth, and the life. Lord, you are the only one who can save. God, I just pray that we could seek to glorify you with our lives and everything that we do. 
Lord, we thank you for today and the blessing of your word. In your holy name we pray. Amen.